and hello and welcome back to another episode of Board Chitless. Uh, welcome to all the new listeners, if there are any, and welcome back to all the diehard chitheads from all around the everywhere. If we had analytics, then we'd know where you're from, but otherwise we'll just continue with the podcast. I'm Lecky, and today I'm joined by... Dave. And Tristan. And Sam. And tonight we've been playing Forbidden Desert and Merchants and Marauders, and also we've got a very special guest as well joining us today so let's get straight into it and talk about forbidden desert dave what was forbidden desert all about well forbidden desert is a little sort of puzzly game by matt leacock it's it's like sort of a sort of spiritual successor to forbidden island we played it with five players today and it was quite hard wasn't it (laughs) we got (laughs) crucified we got really battered by the sands basically the idea is you've crashed in a desert and you've got to go around looking under all the sand for bits of your airship. It's like a steampunky thing. Um, what else could you say about Forbidden Desert? It's a co-op adventure game. Oh, the basics. Yeah, we could do, we could do that. We could go that route. It's a co-op adventure game um, where you lose if you play with too many people. <laughs> <laughs> So essentially, you've just got to go around the um, a set of tiles, clearing sand and trying to discover where the different parts of a, like it's an old Da Vinci, da Vinci style airship to help get you out of it. It's like fighting a phoenix, but without Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> it's exactly that. <laughs> it's exactly that, yeah. So Basically, you, you play as a collection of hero adventurers who have all have different skills. It's quite a simple to play game because you can only do four actions on your go. So it's just moving to another tile and get clearing sand from that tile or exploring it to try and find hidden treasures in the desert that will help you escape sandstorms or burning sun or jetpack around the desert looking for parts uh, parts of the ship that you're going to fly away in. So it's almost like a reverse Forbidden Island, isn't it? Because mm. in Forbidden Island, you're trying to escape this sinking island, whereas in Forbidden Desert, the sand storms are stacking up and you have to sort of fight your way out of those. It uh, plays quite quickly. The art... I think. What do you think of the art compared to Forbidden Island? Funnily enough, I've not thought that much about the art compared to Forbidden Island. Um, even though it's very much drier, quite literally, there's less water in it. It's a lot, there's a lot more like yellows and blues as opposed to just being like greens and blues. Um, thematically, it works, and it is very. It does feel very different. I don't know what I'm talking about now. I think, to be honest, for me personally, I think the art is prettier. In Forbidden Island, and I actually prefer the theme of Forbidden Island because of that. But uh, I think the mechanics are better implemented in Forbidden Desert. They're a bit neater, a bit slicker. You have a bit more control over what you're doing. And it has these treasure cards that you can collect, which add like cool elements that you don't really get in Forbidden Island, which is another co-op survival game where you're hunting for treasures and trying to es- escape like a a, <laughs> a trapped place. Um, but yeah, both short playing co-op adventure games sam any thoughts uh i just i think forbidden desert is just a little bit more complex uh it seems to have a few more moving parts but other than that they are both kind of interchangeable to a degree i feel uh you could put either one on the table and it wouldn't really make a difference i don't feel strongly either way again for either one of them i do think the artwork the tiles and everything for forbidden island is a lot prettier it feels more life, but that's in the theme itself. Yeah, I suppose the main draw for this game over Forbidden Island would be that the tiles move around um, each turn. So in Forbidden Island, every time the waters rise, obviously it, you get to work out uh, where water is and you add more on top and then occasionally parts of the island disappear. With Forbidden Desert, it kind of mimics a sandstorm. So sand comes in and then the tiles will move vertically or horizontally if they can, which kind of distorts where certain unexplored areas might be and just kind of like mix it up a little bit. I suppose which adds an interesting dynamic to the gameplay. We've not really played much of Forbidden Island after we started playing Forbidden Desert. I think we've played one or two games, but not so much that I've really noticed a huge difference, like you're saying, really. What do you think on that, Dave? I'd, I'd prefer to play Desert... Uh, desert. I prefer to p- play Forbidden Island. I think it's a... I don't think it's necessarily a better game, but I think you, for what it is, I just think it works better... Uh, Forbidden Desert, the, I, I really like the, the treasure finding mechanic where it sort of points where it is. You don't really get that in Forbidden 
uh, island. You just flip the card, right? You know, well, you know in advance, don't you, where it is because it's, yeah, there's two options, and you that's can go it. ahead and get it from either place. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's much better implemented in Forbidden Desert. Uh, but everything else, I think I prefer Forbidden Island. The art definitely blows the art out of Forbidden Desert. Maybe not out of the water, but it's it's much more varied. Is that because it's so dry? Y- y- oh, yes. Yeah. Boo. <laughs> Terrible. Excellent, excellent recycling of a much better delivered joke from earlier in the podcast, I <laughs> Just prefer it. But we haven't played Forbidden Island as much since we've been playing this, but... I would like to. Maybe we mix it up next time. Yeah, yeah. They're both short playing games, though, and the advantage is you can squeeze one in at the start of a session, mm. and it's not going to take more than 45 minutes, really, to batter through and just get that sort of cool um, thematic co op experience. But um, what do we think of the game in like its entirety, like in terms of complexity, playability? Is it the kind of thing that we play as a group, really? It's sort of like a, it's an intro to the night, isn't it? But I don't think it's one that. Necessarily. Yeah, it's a, it's a good intro to the night and it's a great one to play with kids. I don't mean it's too much to pick up, uh, too much to learn. It's not too complicated. I feel like it's a not a pared down version of Thunderbirds, but there's not as much going on as with Thunderbirds, which sometimes can drag on a little bit. So it's almost like, you know, if you've got some younger children and you've got a bit of time to kill before tea or just after tea before they've got to do their homework or whatever, then yeah, you can probably fit this one in a lot more easily than you could with Thunderbirds. Very accessible from the game mechanics, definitely, because it's really easy to pick up and just get involved. And I think non-gamers can pick this up quite easily and just get through an adventure really quick. In terms of difficulty, do you think we even stood a chance tonight with five players? I think a lot of a lot of these sorts of games do. It's, it doesn't scale particularly well as a player count goes up. Um, we really did. We were up against it because by the time your turn rolls around, you could have had like four or five it's damage, really, isn't it? But yeah, it's, it's, it's damage. Um, yeah. It's water. Your yeah. water levels. Yeah, you you without having a turn could find yourself uh, dehydrating and dying. Yeah. Uh, as a result of everybody else's goes, if you happen to be stranded out in the middle of the desert. Mm. Whereas if you if it's like two players, you, your turns are coming around pretty quickly, and that's another problem as well with with the player count. It, it, the downtime's quite big for what it is. You. you it takes moments to sort of plan your turn, really, doesn't it? And then it takes minutes for it to go around the table. So yeah, I do. I do find that it does move along at a bit of a clip. I know what you mean. Sometimes waiting quite a while yeah. to just you know move, move, clear, move um, can be a bit frustrating. But it doesn't feel like you're really waiting that long. It's not like anyone's really scratching their head, wondering for too long what they're going to get up to. Really, personally, I think these are all of the reasons why it doesn't hit the table very much. Why we're not able to make those massive comparisons because it just doesn't fulfil my gaming needs for one of a better term I don't massively enjoy playing it it's just, <laughs> I just don't think there's enough going on uh, there's not enough thought it becomes a puzzle but then it, the puzzle's always changing the goalpost is always moving you, you either win easily but you, or you never feel like you get on top of it and it just kind of saps some of the enjoyment out of it for me uh, personally like if I was to rate it it's probably on only the both games Forbidden Island for it the Midden Desert, they're only about four or five out of ten for me. Just not not there for me. I would counter that by saying that the price on these is insanely cheap. It's probably less than 20 quid. And um, for in terms of bang for the buck and the amount of times you play it, especially with families and non-gamers, I'd say it's actually a really cool investment. And even if we don't play it that often, the amount of times we've played it already, I think I've more than made my money back on it. And for a, a family-friendly co-op adventure game, I think it's, it's top-notch. But... I do think, yeah, it, it would probably suffer in comparison to the deeper, more thematic games that we tend to play as a group. So in summary then, Forbidden Desert, a great one to play if you're short on time, but don't expect it to fill out your games night. So now we can move on to our very special guest. I'm very excited about this one. So tonight on the board Chitless, we have Mark Chaplin. Uh, game designer Mark Chaplin was born in Portsmouth, England, and has since lived all over the country, now residing in Nottingham. An avid player of Dungeons and & Dragons and Tunnels and & Trolls, he developed his first board game at the tender age of 11, based on Dalek's Invasion Earth. He's the designer of the award-winning card game based on John Carpenter's The Thing, but is perhaps best known as the creator of the Wild West game Revolver and the alien invasion game Invaders. His latest is a sci-fi survival horror game called Life Form. 
which we're all anticipating greatly. When's uh, when's Life One coming out, Mark? Well, we finished the game years ago. I mean, it's been, it seems to be going on forever. You know, from a design point of view, the game is already... Um, I just can't even remember how long ago I started designing it. All of the art is now done. Um, we've, we've had four artists on it. Um, the board is 99.5, say, percent complete. We've just got, say, the last round of uh, people play testing on the you know the near finished board but the board's the main thing and it's taken forever um to get right you know the style of it you know how do you do you just do like a cutaway of a starship you know um or do you have it uh, every room individually um painted you know with shadow or do you go for a cleaner design now that that's virtually nailed, the rest of it will fall into place. The cards are nearly all done, so we're nearly we're nearly there. Sorry, it was it was rude of me to jump in and just ask you that, Mark. That's that that question was born from a personal desire. I have to play the game as soon as possible. But could you give us um, an elevator pitch, like overview of what is life form? What's it going to be? The elevator pitch. It's an intergalactic horror that fights against the. the ill-equipped and not super-powered or prepared mining crew of a of a starship one player plays the alien and the you know the renegade android that goes amok and the other players all form the crew of the starship and i think we've done a lot of things unique in the area of kind of semi-hidden movement games you know you've got letters from Whitechapel and fury of dracula and it's not it's kind of like those games i guess but we've got our own unique spin on it 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 isn't really like any of those and also there's another game that came out recently that really interested me but it seems to have flopped last friday it's called it's basically friday the 13th board game i don't know if you've played that Uh, was was that a kickstarter the horror thing Uh, could have been friday the 13th one wasn't it yeah i I got it and i uh, it was one of those things we think oh shit they've um before ours comes out, they might have hit on some of the elements, but they hadn't. Nobody has. So um, I'm like, yes, thank God, another <laughs> year gone by, and no one has um, uh, has like cloned it or something. You think, why has nobody done a game like that? But it 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 was incredibly difficult to get right. Actually, I think we do enough unique um, aspects to it that people might get a kick out of it, and it plays really quick. If, if about an hour to an hour and a half is pretty fast definitely within an hour and a half and that's with four players so um it doesn't it doesn't play you could i guess well we're still thinking about how you could maybe do five or six players but it won't for for when it's released it'll it'll only do two to four the the alien has a unique deck and there's no text on any of the cards except or or not um uh, it's all icon driven so each card's maybe got three to five options down the left hand side which um are uh, a row so it might have two or three icons so one of the icons might be move and search or you know you get the idea one another card might have a survival icon or a flamethrower or a shot prod or something like that so each card has got a number of different actions that you can do because you've got to collect resources before you can leave the starship the main game, 90% of the game is on the starship trying to get off it before it explodes or you're eaten by the alien or whatever other nasty things she wants to do. But you may get onto the shuttle and, you know, like the Nostromo's um, Narcissus at the end. And that might be, may, it may or may not happen. If it doesn't happen, you've definitely lost as the crew. But if you're on the shuttle at the end, the other combat icons along the bottom of the cards come into play. So the hand management there is, as you're playing, you might go, Christ, this is a great card if the if I ever get to fight the alien in the shuttle at the end. Yeah, but yeah. I'm this flamethrower right now, and so you've got um, you've got to think long term, you know, strategically as well as tactically. The alien cards work similar. It's got attack icons, the most powerful actions it can do during the course of the main, uh, uh, you know, the, the the fight and the, the stalking on the starship uh, have got the best fighting elements for the end. So it's got a again, it's not a done deal that the alien will get on board the shuttle either. Being a fan of Invaders, it sounds like there's an awful lot of opportunity for the crew to get shut down quite early on, or you know, mid game. It sounds like it's going to keep everybody on their toes, even with the alien, if people can possibly second guess what it might be up to. Uh, Mark, just so our listeners have a bit more um, information on your background and kind of build a bit of a profile for you, what can you just explain to us um, what your life is outside of board gaming? What's your what does the day job entail? My current day job has been since I basically my daughter was born. Um, I work for Raw Mail. And I've done that for about 11 years now. Previous to that, in my 30s, I was um, 
uh, a senior manager for Morrison's and a, for quite a long time was a store manager, retail store manager for um, uh, Summerfield, you know, food retail. So my background was management. I'm not management at Royal Mail. I decided I wanted to um, write a book. And so I, and I burnt out. I burnt out in my mid 30s. I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, uh, 60, 70 hour weeks and being phoned up even when you got home, working seven days a week. I was like, no, I'm not doing this anymore. So I had to, you know, cut my cloth from my means and what have you. And I did write a book. I wrote two books. Didn't get anywhere with either of them, but it just shows my. I've always had like a creative uh, bend and that's basically what it brought me to now. The great thing about Royal Mail is you finish early and you're, uh, you know, you could, there's an awful lot of time where you can be thinking about board game design or listening to podcasts or, uh, you know, whatever you, you wish wish to do. So worked out, and, and also I get to spend a lot more time with, you know, my daughter because I don't do like a nine to five job. I start before anybody else gets up, you know, and you're home by two o'clock. On the subject of this creative bent and, and writing, what led you to board game design then? How did that all come about? As you'd already read at the beginning, I I was primarily a role player. I was really, really into Games Workshop because that was the only place of designing the kind of games that we liked, you know, like Blood Royale and um, Space Hack and what have you, before Games Workshop turned a corner and Ian Livingston and, you know, Steve Jackson left. And so, but as primarily, we were all role players. We played huge campaigns that took forever, you know, and almost exclusively, I was the, you know, the dungeon master. I just, I preferred, I never was really that satisfied with other people's adventures, or I just preferred, I, maybe it was less that, it was more, I just preferred creating the adventures. After I'd written my first book, I had an idea in my head, hey, I could do a really interesting siege um, card game I had in my head um, involving the characters and that from my book. I just thought it would be a cool thing to do and I thought I'd always, um, right, I've got a book in me so I wrote two and then I thought I think I've got a game in me but then I didn't get around to doing it um, and then we got into playing a lot of um, we went from role playing to board gaming and I moved to Nottingham and we had like a new phase of getting, you know, a new blush of board games and Knizia games, you know, and the group in Beeston, Nottingham that I started playing with one of the guys there, he said uh, he just said, he's that type of guy, he's very spontaneous. He said to everybody one evening as I came in and we had whatever game we were going to play, he said, oh, by the way, I've got an announcement. Well, Mark has. I said, have I? He goes, yeah, you're designing a game. We're going to help you play test it. Well, that wasn't anything that had been discussed. He just said it off the top of his head. But once he'd said it, I thought, actually, that's a pretty cool idea. He was just, you know, and I did that. And that game ended up being invaders actually so like sometimes when people get their first book published it's actually the one they wrote third or something uh, revolver was i designed later on invaders was the first game that i designed uh, you know proper design i guess so uh, though it's changed a hell of a lot since when it when it started but that's what you get from publisher um involvement well that's so. that's what happened with Ali uh, with revolver isn't it Re revolver came from aliens which is where i first got into your game designs the the aliens yeah. uh, this time it's war card game and obviously that had to be um rejigged i guess by it, uh, by the publisher to because of the ip right so that's yes. where the wild though west they, theme came in it, though they wanted um initially they said oh we can do it as, um we'll just do it like they do you know let's do a generic buzz cut marine game against some alien designs of Chechu. Well, I didn't know Chechu then, and he probably could have done a kick-ass version of that. And maybe that would have sold more. I don't know. The Revolver's probably, uh, it's certainly my most successful selling game. Um, and maybe, the but, but I just thought at the time, nah, and I didn't really know them. Well, I didn't know them. And I didn't know anybody else. And I thought, I don't really want to do a generic. If it's not aliens, let's do something else. So I sent them a list of about six different um Themes I thought could be interesting. Wild West was on there. I thought in my I, my preference was like for a um, a dirty dozen World War Two type game, and uh, or you know, you know uh, the cigar chomping uh, men on a mission. That's it. Yeah, I love those movies. They just don't make them anymore. You know, like Where Eagles Dare. I, I've still got a game like that in my in my head that I, you know, basically based on where, uh, you know, um, the 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 mountain top castle, you know, that that fabled Nazi location that needs clearing out behind you know, enemy lines. Yeah, so, but anyway, so, but they didn't want to go there, and they said let's do Wild West, and it turned out that um, Johnny DeVries, the CEO of White Goblin, knew an awful lot about guns. Uh, uh, and a wild west weaponry so he he so they wanted to do that 
And that's what it became. There are a few mistakes made along the way. Some of the cards aren't as I designed them. So slightly different from the, the print and play one that I did. And also we had a few fights, as you will always do, but by fights I mean, you know, small battles where they wanted to call stuff the most bonkers names a bit, um, and I was like, no, you can't do that. But I also, because I didn't, I was very new to the industry and I thought that, you know, they paid me a load of money up front, which I don't think people do really anymore. And I felt a bit beholden to them and I didn't know them. So I back down and Lee was saying choose your battle so I basically you know there's a couple of small skirmishes that I chose to fight and some of the things that they did I w didn't really want to do but they you know I was like they're going to publish my game so you know it's not like there was no kickstarter then was there so um uh, there was no other avenue and I didn't shop it around in fact I didn't shop that get around they came to me so i was pretty lucky but i guess i was a bigger fish in a smaller pond than it is like 10 years on and i slipped some of my thematic you know like easter eggs but not as many as i did in invaders and date invaders of armageddon that's ridiculous for the number of movie references or it just was refer brilliant though <laughs> it was just, brilliant. Uh, we've, been, we've been playing revolver and invaders and talking about them in the last couple of episodes of uh, board shitless in in anticipation of this interview and it's, one, one yeah. of the things that comes across really heavily is the theme of for these you know effectively fast playing card games you know they're not um, they're not massively um narrative focused they are still action card games but the theme in them and the theme of the characters and the stories behind them is yeah hugely compelling and especially trying to count the references of all the uh john carpenter and uh, 1980s sci-fi movies and stuff that are, <laughs> that are thrown yeah. into invaders Love yeah i mean that, obviously that's by design but um, Johnny and co from White Goblin, they tend to pull back from that. They're not so keen on, um, or maybe they just didn't understand it. Like one of the, they really didn't want to call the extra, um, like health token, true grit. I was like, that was one of the things from the beginning. They wanted to call it regenerate. I was like, are you kidding? They're not trolls. <laughs> Regenerating <laughs> cowboys. <laughs> I know, they, they, but that's a language thing, I guess. But they were like, no, I want to do this. Anyway, um, but it came out pretty good in the end. And, and also one of the things that um, they changed, and especially with Revolver 2, they said, we can only afford for so many pieces of art. And I'm sure this happens a lot with published games. And they said, but you've got too many card types. So some of it, you basically have to take out. This is after all the playtesting has been done, remember? So you, you then end up like, in the initial revolver there's something like 10 or 12 sheriff deputies isn't there and um and there was but there was a lot more um like subgroups in revolver too but some of them had to go because they wouldn't pay for individual art i mean that's fine because they've got to make a profit there's no point in making a game but you do end up with a design that isn't quite as you'd you know we lost some really cool things with revolver too um but loads of other really uh, cool things got in and eventually I bullied them into doing the little mini expansion for revolver two. And that's got some fun things in it. Um, quite proud of that. I, I, I don't, I don't know what the impact of that is. It came out so late after the game, everybody forgotten about it, but kudos to white goblin that they release expansions of games. Nobody even remembers. So that's, um, <laughs> I think that Did they, Sorry, I was just going to say, th these discussions and concessions that you had to make with White Goblin and certainly the, the language differences, did that feed into your development of life form as uh, language free? Because you were talking before about it being uh, heavily uh, icon based uh, without text on the cards and stuff. So is this something that's come about with uh, dealing with an international uh, publisher and an international audience? Uh, I can't really say 100% though. The, the objective, the, the secret objective cards in life form, they've got text on. And one of the publishers has already said, well, I think you should do that with, replace all that with icons. It'd be ridiculous. It'd be one of those games of 20 icons in each card and you'd need a, a, a crib sheet just to read what the card did. And I said, also, you, if there's no art on some particular cards, the only theme injection you're going to get is from the title of the card and maybe there's some little description on it. So I've not backed down from that. It seems that you're, you're hugely influenced thematically by sci-fi. I was wondering mechanically, is there any game designers that you're kind of, that you're following with Revolver and with Invaders and with Lifeform coming up? Yeah, I suppose the people I most admire, modern modern ones, I guess, would be, I can't remember how to pronounce his name, K Corey Kniska, is it? K Corey you know, the, K. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He, From Fantasy Flight. The only game I think he's designed... I've not played all his games, uh, but I really like some of them. I like the first edition Mansions of Madness. I like um, Star Wars Rebellion. 
yes, it's the theme, but what for the, the sort of grand design, especially Mansions of Madness, it's like a... Uh, I mean, you can see why they'd replace it with an app, but it, it, there's a lot of spinning plates with it. But the, the one game I think is perfect that he's been involved in, or almost perfect, as good as you're going to get for a blast, is um, Star Wars Destiny, the new dice game. I don't know if you've played it. The only problem, the only problem with it is it's collectible, which obviously puts a lot of people off. Um, but if you can get past that, and you you know you're pool like if you played magic with friends if no one's got a vast collection compared to everybody else you can have some fairly that the game's fantastic it really is so that there's him um obviously reiner the good doctor some of my favorite games are of his i really like even though you would think they wouldn't be games that i should like if you know what i mean because i'm more uh, thematic oriented i guess um i really like tigris and euphrates and lord of the ring confrontation a lot of Reiner games, even some of his card games, you know, like Knights of Charlemagne and what have you. Um, who else do I like? There's some people, it's just one design, like Stefan Feld. He's done a card game, Roma and Roma 2, basically just different iterations of the same game. It is fantastic um, two-player card game. Uh, a bit like Invaders, I guess, in that it's like a knife fight in a phone booth type game. And you really have to hammer it. It's not like one of those games you sit there and you're just like punching each other in the face for 20 minutes each. And... But some of his other games I played, like Trajan, I absolutely, I, I really admired like the Mancala action mechanism, but the games felt totally dull for me. Um, most of his other games, actually, but then he, but for that game, he hit me. Who else? Richard Borg, I think that's his name. You know, the Command and Colors guy? I really like the um, Memoir 44 back in the day. Um, more recently, the Napoleonics, just I'm interested in. Uh, you know that type of old artillery yeah. combined up. You know, ready aim fire. You know, uh, <laughs> it's quite a line of guns on the hill. That type of thing. I like pulpy. Um, you know, colonial era uh, as well. Who else? Are, are uh, you just going to go through every game designer <laughs> that's ever yeah. touched the medium now? <laughs> oh yeah, there's loads of others, I guess. So yeah, I'm probably doing that, aren't I? I could, like I said, I could talk all evening. <laughs> well, one one other thing. Yeah, I was going to say, Mark. We'll have to get you back on for uh, an, another interview. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up with you another time. But I, th- I think tonight we've got time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, Go on then. I was going to say you brought us pretty much full circle, bringing it back to fantasy, uh, fantasy for light games. And I was wondering, with Life Form coming out, is there any sort of marketing tactics that you might be following Fantasy Flight with, or are you just going to kind of do your own thing with trying to get that out to the people? Uh, I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Actually, um, clearly, what I've done so far hasn't worked because it hasn't become <laughs> it hasn't been published yet. I'm like the the slowest project manager on anything. <laughs> Um, would you consider Kickstarter, Mark? I would consider it, but w- the one element that scares the life out of me, I've seen some very successful campaigns run by, you know, giants of the industry, tank, but do really successful, but then they've almost had to remortgage their house because, um, and Cthulhu Wars was one of these, he was done something like $50,000 out of pocket because of the shipping. I'm like, blip that. But, 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 but that's not the... That's not the thing that most scares me. I don't know any contacts in the manufacturing. I know you've um, done very well with um, uh, kickstarting yours, but I wonder, I've heard horror stories, if you haven't got a contact in China or somebody at the docks when the pallets are loaded, you know, how do you know the stuff's <laughs> people? What if the manifest wrong? You've got to do a, a deal that? with a guy in a mask yeah. <laughs> on the corner of the street. Did that freighter arrive from Korea, Tristan? Did you, I mean, did you send the extra yet? Yeah. On, <laughs> on the crater, okay. Are you covered on insurance, you know, if the pallet tips over or what happened? I just don't know these things. And the, it's fear of the unknown that stops him from that. I've got no, I've got 100% confidence that it would do do pretty well, I guess, for a niche science fiction game, especially if somebody had miniatures. But I wouldn't even, uh, I wouldn't even get, I wouldn't um, uh, countenance doing that myself. It would t- that would just take another ton of time and in another area I don't know anything about. It doesn't but, seem like a huge miniatures based game either. Really, it's it's not the focus of the gameplay. Is it tactical miniatures combat? No. No, no, but I have been approached by, um, I can tell you, Ares Games who are interested and they're talking about kickstarting it. And no doubt, as we all know, games with miniatures in kickstart bigger and faster than games that don't. And you could quite easily replace all of the stand crew standees, you know, with miniatures. But it'd more, be more about 
the crew than the alien because obviously um there's only one it wouldn't be one of those games where you've got look at the you know the tentacles on that and lots of bare-breasted um promotional you'd have have to have a thousand crew members as stretch goals (laughs) yeah that and see that wouldn't happen either so um yeah it would be very it would have to be very a tight campaign but i would imagine i don't know what they would do with that so so you're definitely more more focused on the the design and the creativity rather than the the whole publishing and the, the the hassle that comes with that Yes, certainly. The last two things I've designed have been expansions for other people's print and play games. You know, I could have designed two games and took them to a publisher in the meantime, I guess, or, you know, kickstarted. I know enough artists and that now uh, that I could probably get a decent card game banged out fairly fast, I think, if, you know, if you had the resources and the, you know, if the, if the game worked. But I, I'm not driven like that. You know, I... Um, I basically, I, I think now I've nailed all my favourite sci-fi and there's nothing left. So, <laughs> you know, the thing I've done, I've nearly, fini- I've nearly finished a, a, a board version of that and um, I've done Aliens. There's only Alien left, really. <laughs> what, you know, the other, I, there's many other movies I admire, but none of them, you know, have that spark where you want to make the board game version of it. Well, listen, Mark. I know. I know it's going to be uh, really successful, and we're, we're definitely looking forward to Life Farm, whichever way you do choose to go about doing it. I mean, if you if you do do the Kickstarter route, one thing I can say is, when it funds, which I know it will, uh, the publishers will be in contact with you. That's what will happen, and 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 they'll take that out of your hands. But whichever um, method you do choose to publish it, we definitely wish you all the best, and we're really looking forward to playing it. Which is why I have to bring it to UK Games Expo so we can have. First tips <laughs> on a, a playtest of it. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And as I said, we definitely want to get you back on again sometime and we can have a another chat about all the other stuff we've got to talk about. But uh, really appreciate you coming on tonight. Sorry, I really appreciate your time. So <laughs> it's great. It's great content. And uh, it's been great to see you again. Okay. Th- thanks, Tristan. So, yeah. So that was Martin Chaplin, designer of Revolver, Invaders, and the upcoming Life Orb. We're moving on to the second game of the evening, which was Merchants and Marauders. And to tell you a bit more about that, it's Dave! Hi! Um, Merchants and Marauders is a game about pirates and merchants and marauders and pirates. It's about (laughs) pirates, mostly. You're moving around the map of the Caribbean and you are either trading or you are attacking merchant ships and taking their stuff and then selling that. Um, If you played any sort of trading game before it's pretty similar it's pick up and deliver with some combat thrown in there's some really nice mechanics with the boarding merchant ships um and then the combat's dice based so that's fairly sort of look um intensive but really good game yeah i um i can agree with that assessment of the look the look intensivity by getting all the luck in the first few turns and running away with the game it was amazing i think we should get a copy of this for everybody that we know and so we can play it all the time um <laughs> what i really liked about this game is winning. that <laughs> the winning i think letter. like you might still be g'd up on that <laughs> yeah, wing. i think a little bit i've still got the adrenaline rush um but each tile so the board is broken down into like tiles or segments for want of a better word and they've each got a port on there apart from one and then they've all got a merchant ship which you can seek out and destroy um if you wish to so what I found was dead nice was that one person can be playing a really effective pick up and deliver game and the other person can just be going nuts with the piracy, which is what I did. Mm. And you could never actually directly interact with each other throughout the entire game, but one of you could just kind of pick the win from the, un- from the other player. Apart from the mass brawl at the end yeah. of the game. The there, inevitable there is, brawling. There is, direct, yeah, there is direct contact. There is, you can attack each other and... Uh, take out each other's players but it just wasn't happening much and I think that was because we had three people going around trading and you going around like a, just pillaging everything yeah but I didn't pillage people until you, right you, at the you, end you it, could was have the, done, it was the faceless merchants you could have done you just chose not to because you're yeah yeah I did I, it was it was very much the strategy <laughs> I was employing and uh, and no other reason other than that really you, you struck at the at the right time though Right, so when you did attack, that was the one that won you the game because that was me, and I was on my way to. I had a, a massive stash of gold, and I was on my way back to the port to sort of cash it all in and and win the game. And Lecky just came and took everything from me. What did you learn from that, Dave? I learned to stash your gold 
<laughs> well, stash your gold earlier. And then stash not to, some gold. <laughs> don't put all your eggs in one basket and uh, just stay away from Lecky, really. Just whatever game you're playing, just, just don't talk to him. Don't make it's, eye contact. It's not just for games, that. <laughs> just just yeah. stay away from Lecky. <laughs> Because when he goes, he really does go for the throat. In- <laughs> Interestingly, this is exactly how I lost last time to you, Dave. <laughs> oh, well, we, we don't talk about that. <laughs> it is, um, I know it's not strictly a, you know, 4X game, but it does end like a 4X game, really, where everyone notices that someone else is going to win and then you just do what you can to try and block that. And then if you can't do that, then it's a mad race for second place. I just Which I, which I won. I got the second place, yes. Exactly, <laughs> and there's um there's there's quite a few different ways in which you can grab those extra points at the end. Um, like Dave was saying, he's like filled his hole full of cargo and tried to make a mad dash to his home. I managed to intervene when it came to that. And then Sam, uh, you were playing a bit of a switch, like double game, weren't you? Where you were basically trading most of the time, but then a few bits of combat kind of kept you in it. Yeah, the, it. I noticed everyone did get frustrated at my trading because that seemed to slow down the game quite a bit. The drawing and buying of cards and evaluating that that slowed the turns down but that was where i was making money constantly and i was trading to get the glory points got to the the last turn you'd just rot up into your port with all your money so i couldn't stop you from winning at that stage uh, but i was able to then take out tristan uh just to steal the last bit of money which because i didn't have any at that point so you, <laughs> you didn't steal any money off me i, I would have done if you had it uh but because I was in my home area at that time, I was able to go straight to the port, bank my money, and that put me right up to within that grasping distance of, of that first place. And I thought I was miles off winning. So it all sort of switched around the last the last moment. And it does make me think if I'd have done some of those things earlier on in the game, I'd have been in much better position right at the end. You know, if I'd have banked some of that money earlier on instead of spending it all and yeah. buying and selling. And I did get quite distracted by a lot of the the rumours and the missions, but they were also getting me glory points. So it kind of, yeah, I was, I was playing a whole mixed bag of different ways. Yeah, the, um, the stashing element of the game. So you can build up go- um, gold by trading items or by looting ships. And if you're in your home port or you've got a special event card that lets you do it, you can then stash into your secret, you know, treasure chest. No one can see that. And halfway through the game, I noticed three quarters of the way through the game, you actually forget who sashed what and where and if someone is actually sitting on quite a nest egg for their retirement and it does make you really paranoid yeah i stashed nothing until that last turn <laughs> I, I stashed nothing at all i tried to and uh... what do we think of the mechanics of the game and how well do they implement the theme of being privates and privateers sorry merchants and marauders I, I think that a lot of the mechanics are quite seamless. They work well thematically. They're all ingrained straight in there. You know, you're going to ports and you're selling, you're buying, you're repairing your ship. Um, the combat can be a little bit confusing. You have dice rolls, but then you ignore them unless you have another specific dice roll that came out well. And then you ignore that because you have to roll the dice again. And at some points you really wonder what, what happened and why didn't I just buy some, go- you know, buy some grain. Um, but other than a few confusing moments where you're trying to learn roughly what's going on, it does all move quite fluidly and there's not too much point when you've got to consult the rule book in too much depth. What do you guys think? Apart from the odd refresher for a couple of rules, we didn't really have to go back to the rule book. And the player cards covered almost everything in the game. Uh, I looked at that for every move I made and it had almost every eventuality covered off on there. Uh, but yeah, the, in terms of mechanics, I like them. I think they, they do work thematically, even down to the when you sell your goods, you can't or you can't buy the same goods that is in demand at a location. So it stops you from then being able to sell them straight away. You've got to then move on to sell them. And thematically, that's the market there, the port trying to buy in those goods so they won't sell them to you. They, they've gotten on to sell, and I quite like that the way it works mechanically and thematically for that whole whole aspect. But yeah, the combat did feel a bit clunky. Let's not forget as well, you can commandeer Navy ships. So <laughs> you can't buy a Man of War, but you can certainly steal one, which thematically is probably the best thing ever for a pirate game. Um, so we've been kind of been singing this game's praises. Is there any cons for anybody? Um, I know to, like, the player lag, I think, was probably the biggest one for me. You just waiting forever. For, anybody, anyone Someone. that... 
Yeah. <laughs> Anyone that does a port turn, then you might as well go to the chippy, get yourself a snack or make a brew round for everybody because you'll be waiting for a, a short while. If your destination is far enough away, you can potentially miss out on about 30 to 40 minutes of the game whilst you're just plodding across the map making move actions whilst everybody else is having exciting port actions. And God forbid there should be inclement weather, which we had about four turns in a row. Yeah. I, I really like the event cards for driving uh, the, the narrative on a little bit and having pirate ships appear and cool stuff like that. But when it gets to the point where it's almost miss a turn mechanics of uh, you can only move two spaces instead of three and two spaces doesn't get you very far at all. Uh, when that kind of thing kicks in, it can be a little bit frustrating. Um, but even being the recipient or on the receiving end of a lot of the negative effects of those weather cards myself, I still find that I'm invested in what other people are doing if they are fighting and stuff and raiding merchant ships and things like that. I do think it's a um, it, it keeps you in the game. And like Sam was saying at the end there, it almost seemed like there was everything to play for. And if we'd have raided... Lucky on time. If if I'd managed to scout you out, maybe things could have gone differently. Um, if I'd fought Sam and defeated him, maybe things could have gone differently. And and sure, Dave's thinking the same thing. If he'd have got to port before you managed to raid him, you know, we were all still in the game. I think at that point potentially. Um, and but yeah, yeah, you know, you ran away with it fair and square, which I, th- I think I think that's the hallmark of a good game. You know, that none of us truly felt like well, well, you know, that was completely hopeless from the, from the outset. Yeah, and the sheer fact that we can pick over those last two or three turns, you know, for quite a while, you know, look at exactly where it went wrong for us, where it went right for us. What if something else could have happened instead of it working out the way it did shows how easy it is to learn the game as well, rather than us just saying, oh, look, this happened and one of us has won the game because I don't know, but thank God it's over. Um, it really shows that you can pick the game up and really run with it quite quickly, really. So it's our second time, with, well, second time I've played it. Played it three, but, but I mean, we did take a little bit to get going tonight. Um, but once we were going, we were, apart from Sam, we were sort of flying through. But Sam was doing a lot of port stuff. Um, mechanically, I think uh, it's mostly good. There's a couple of bits I'm a bit underwhelmed by. The missions, I don't really think. I've, no, I've never seen a mission. I thought, oh, I need to go and get that. Um, I think in previous games, I might have grabbed a mission if I was in the vicinity, just sort of opportunity sort of thing. But... They've not really done anything. I don't know if the expansion does anything to sort of remedy that. Um, rumours as well, a little bit underwhelming. I think we all sort of played one rumour maybe. Yeah, the, the rumours and the missions seem to me more of something that you'd pick up and just hold in the back your back pocket in case you could pick up some easy gold with it um, rather than you're going to set out to try and do those to win the game as an early strategy. About you guys, did you pick up anything that seemed quite achievable? I do think there seems to be an assumption that because you can, you you need 10 points to win and you can have up to five of that from gold. So there's an assumption that you're going to get those five points from having 50 gold. So with that in mind, the other five points are really quite important. So if you do only get one rumour or one mission, that's, you know, it's a significant step forward towards you, your goal. So I don't mind that too much, but I did think as well, like Dave said, that if... Um, if there's a mission that's a little bit too far away or even too complex, you know, compared to the things, the steps that you need to achieve to c- complete it, then you're just like, oh, screw that, you know, forget that. I'll just uh, carry on tootling around. Um, I do think the game rewards uh, strategic play, not just tactical. So most of the time I find myself in games like this sort of responding to my current situation and trying to find what's the best opportunity play. Whereas I do think if you set out and go, right, I'm a trader, I'm going to really go for the ports where and I can maximise my sales, try and duck out of the way of the pirates and any other aggressive players and stick to that strategy or like like he'd go and raid the hell out of everybody. Uh, then you're more rewarded, whereas I was sort of hovering between the two and not really making my mind up one way or the other. And I, I do feel like um, the game punished me accordingly for for that kind of play, which I think is fair enough. You know, if, if you are developing, it's like a 180 minute game. So you do need to be in with a strategy from the outset, which... Uh, I think it's good and I think it's clever uh, design. I just didn't have a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I didn't have one either, but I, I think I should have. Yeah, to, to counterpoint, they all, uh, you know, ha- having a solid strategy. Um, my captain was very much geared up with strong leadership, strong seamanship to go out and pirate, pirate the hell out of the seas. And I think I'd struggle to identify what a good captain for trading would look like. And I'd probably 
after this success, take it, take the wrong captain into the wrong sort of tactic and then learn from those mistakes. So I think um, for new players to the game, it might take a few playthroughs before you really kind of picked up on which captains worked best with which boats and how to really maximize um, the buffs that you get from them really. But it's a very, very small nitpicky sort of thing to pick out for the game because I think the rest of it works works so beautifully. Yeah, I think my captain was was probably a pretty solid trader. He had um, extra cargo space so he could haul extra stuff. Um, not that it helped. I think my strategy was quite risky really. It was to just sort of patter about, sort of go unnoticed. Um, and then I made a, a dash for it at the end. The, prob- the main problem was that my, my, my home port was a bit out of the way. And I got chased out of it at the very beginning of the game by an NPC pirate. Um, so I ended up trading throughout the east, sort of Eastern Caribbean. And when I went back, it was quite a way back and I got caught on the way by the, the lecky there. So in the open sea, no less. There's, um, there's so much that we could talk about with this game. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time for it. Um, I think if anyone's looking for a really strong thematic pirate game or, you know, sea-based adventure game, then they should really pick up a copy of Merchants from Marauders. I can't think of anything that Zedman could have done to make this a better game, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's a perfect reason to hold on to that tricorn hat that you bought for the Halloween fancy dress party a few years ago. Apparently the apparently the expansion uh, makes it miles better. So, Tristan? Mind blown. It's not available anywhere in the UK. Forget it then. <laughs> is, is it is it just out of print? I think so. I'd, I'd be more than happy to pick up a copy if, if one emerges. But and I've heard yeah I've heard the same thing. A lot of people say the expansion is one of the best expansions ever. Um yeah, I'm really excited to give that a go actually because I do think it could benefit from like some mixed up content and stuff. But even with the base game as it is, I mean we've only played it a couple of times in total. I think three or four times. So uh, I, I think it definitely needs to hit the table more often and stay fresh in our memories so we're not. Uh, having to refer to the player cards as much and just getting stuck into the action. Yeah, my only thing is uh, I do love the game and I think there's very little that could be improved, but I do think that the combat element could do with a bit of fine-tuning. As I said before, I just feel it's a little bit clunky, but it doesn't detract enough from the game. I really enjoy the game. It's just one small critique that uh, that I have with it. Uh, but it's not a big deal. I think it's mainly because I got confused, <laughs> and that as a result, I ended up avoiding battle for as l- combat for as long as possible. Because you you sort of roll dice to find your enemy, you then roll dice to see who's the quickest off the mark, then you're rolling dice for co- allocating damage, and you, you sort of it seems a bit dice heavy that part, and it's a little bit confusing, but. It's not a major part of the game. It's not just about that. In fact, as I say, I did very little combat throughout, so it's not. It's not like major, major issue. It's not just a rolling fest. It's all. But I think it's a fantastic game. I think it's brilliant. Really enjoy it. It's a. I'd say it's probably a good nine out of ten. Strong, strong review there from Sam. And there is there is a lot of moving parts to it. Um, a bit like Archipelago or other big sort of big box games where there's so many systems going on, your brain can melt. Um, but I think it's worth. I think it's worth the pain, especially with that cheat sheet that they give you. It's that makes it so much easier. All the basic rules are out there for you to quickly look up. It doesn't doesn't take too much really to uh, keep on top of, in my opinion. So there we have it. Then Merchants and Marauders, a great game to play if you're into piracy or merchanting. <laughs> or merchanting, but let's face it, no one's going to be buying textiles and selling them. <laughs> People off. play Agricola. So that put me right back in my box. (laughs) So thanks very much for joining us for another installment of Board Chitless. Please join us on Facebook and remember to place any posts in there of anything that you'd like us to talk about or if you just want to join the conversation. And also, if you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud or to leave any comments there, that would be brilliant. So thanks once again for joining us and we'll see you next week for some more board games and a lot more talk. Bye-bye.